So if you have your Bibles, I just ask you to turn to John 12. This was announced earlier today, uh, Palm Sunday. I wonder what I'm going to preach about. Um, that's not always true, though. I, I know that the, one that's, the guy that's filling in for me at Country Faith is preaching something totally different. The Lord's led him in a different direction, and that's fine. But we are going to look at what is known as the triumphal entry and some things that the Lord said on that day. But uh, actually, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Let's just dedicate this time to the Lord. Lord, we just come before you, Lord, with thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you for fellowship. Lord, I thank you for that we can find family wherever we go, Lord, because your grace is known and your grace has been experienced. And Lord, we ask for your grace here this morning, Lord, on myself. I pray that you just get myself out of the way. I pray all my issues would just get thrown to the side, Lord, and I can move in what you would have me say here this morning. Lord God, I got some notes, but Lord, if you want to deviate from that, Lord, so be it. Have your way. I pray that you'd bless the reading of your word, and Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for what you have to say, myself included, this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Palm Sunday. I want to, you're in John 12, and that's, that's the main passage we're going to be in, but I just want to read a little verse out of Luke, it's actually in Luke 19, verse 11, to kind of set the stage as to where the mindset was. It's not really addressed in John, but in the Luke account it is, and it's, it's right before the parable of the, the, the talents and, uh, that the Lord spoke prior to the triumphal entry, but Luke says, and now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. That was the mindset. This morning I want to start with just looking at what was the mindset of the people concerning Jesus Christ. We know he's coming towards, you know, the end of his ministry, triumphal entry here. And um, crucifixion was, is within a week away. And what are the people thinking about this guy? Um, so let's start reading in John 12, starting in verse 9, where it says, Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, speaking of Christ, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, who he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. First thing I want to look at is, okay, what, what was the mindset of a lot of the people. We saw in the Luke account that many people felt at that time that the kingdom of God was coming, but the problem was they defined that as a restoration of the nation of Israel. They had been under Roman dominion for years and years, oppression, taxes were high, the value of life was an all-time low. Uh, you know, the, the Romans were noted for their, their dominance, and they certainly dominated themselves over the Jews. And many wanted to see Israel restored. And you know, when John the Baptist or when Jesus came and said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, hey, they were all for that. But in their mind, they pictured a restoration of the kingdom of David, the kingdom of Israel. And they thought that, all right, we're going to get back to what we know needs to be. I know we have been under judgment of God for many years, but surely this is the time. And then when Jesus would say certain things like, well, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is within you. It's like, what does that mean? The kingdom is within me? I thought the kingdom was there. I thought the kingdom was the nation of Israel. And so there was probably a certain amount of confusion that went along with that. Also, we see in the reading of the passage here in John, is that many people came, dare I say, because Jesus was probably kind of a little bit of a tourist attraction. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. This was some awesome things going on. Word had traveled. And we're going to go to Jerusalem. Maybe we're going to have the chance to see this guy that we've heard so much about. Did they really believe on him? Did they really understand who he was? Maybe not. Probably not. You know, if you go to a circus, you know, you got the bearded lady over here and the muscle man over here. So that maybe, you know, we'd have the, the prophet from Nazareth here. He's just sort of a tourist attraction. This is something we can see. We'll pay a few bucks to see him. But was there anything really in their hearts concerning that? I'm sure there was a group that that was not the case. And there might have been some that looked at Christ as a tourist attraction and also wanted the kingdom of Israel restored. So they took both views. And surely, surely there was a group of people that knew who Jesus was, had experienced the real thing, 
And they were there also. So when you have these kind of different views all coming together in a holiday such as the Passover was, you know, Jerusalem would swell to like 200 to 250,000 people, which was just huge. They were just bursting at the seams. And the chatter was there. It was a hectic thing. There was a, a lot of activity and things going on. And you imagine people are chattering. Maybe they haven't seen each other for years. And what about this Jesus? What's, what, what's the... The, the most recent story concerning him. And there were a lot of opinions floating around. You know, I have to wonder sometimes, I think some of the tactics of the enemy is to throw a lot of options out there. You know, we live in a, we live in a, in a culture that is, is rapidly getting to the point where they deny wholeheartedly absolute truth. It's like you can have your truth and I'll have mine and you can say it's cold outside and I can say it's hot outside and we're both right. You know? Um, so denying absolute truth is just one step closer to denying Jesus who is actually truth and per, uh, personified. But you know, people are lazy. Can I be real hard on us as just human beings? People are lazy. They don't want to take the time. They don't want to take the time in looking into all of these options. And so it's easier for them to just throw up their hands, look at all the major religions in the world, look at all the philosophies, look at all the cults and sects. How could I possibly figure any of those out? So let me just do whatever feels good for me. And yeah, I can glean a little bit. And we like to talk about it a little bit, but I refuse to allow myself to be challenged with who is Jesus Christ. We talked about this last week. That is the question of the ages. And most people are too lazy to do that. They're too busy with their life, and there's too many options. And yes, there's nice people on that side of the spectrum, and nice people on that side. And so since everyone just is nice, let's not even talk about something that might be divisive, such as, who do you say Jesus is? And I'm sure this was going on at the time. To, to just muddy the waters a little more, you had the religious leaders at this time. The Pharisees. And their mindset at that point was just kill the opposition. We're in charge. We understand the law. All these other commoners. They can't read. They don't understand. And so they just have to blindly follow us because we understand the law of Moses. We understand the law and the prophets. And these men were, were very, very learned in the Scriptures. So I don't take anything away from them. And there were some genuine Pharisees out there that did accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of life and stood for His cause. But most of them as a whole did not. These were the guys that knew and could quote to you, just like that, Messianic prophecies from the Old Testament. When, but when the product of all of those prophecies, the very answer to all those prophecies stood right in front of them. They looked at him in the eye and said, you're demon-possessed. And, and they actually felt good about it when they said it. They felt they were standing for the cause, standing for what they knew was right. And this Jesus fella, he was a threat. So throw that in to the mix to confuse things. Now the Romans, on the other hand, let's take a look at them. They were in charge, obviously. Passover kind of met trouble. They were on edge. It hadn't been very few years ago that what Theodos of Jordan, that he goes down in history as, that actually had led a revolt at this time. He had gone before the, the Jews and said that there was going to be Elijah-like miracles that he was going to produce and went into a rebellion against the Romans. There was a skirmish. 400 men were killed, including Theodos, or Theodos, I think that's how you pronounce it, and actually they cut his head off and hung it on the garrison wall there in Jerusalem. It was probably still up there in Jesus' day. So just as a reminder to the Jews that, hey, Rome rules. Okay? But these Jews were so in turmoil. There was always these people that were these zealots. And they were on edge. And they were watching this. So imagine when this procession comes into town. The Romans are thinking, what next? What is going on? So let's start reading then, continue reading in John 12, verse 12, where it says, The next day a great multitude had come to the feast, and when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed, he was, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel! 
Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him, and that they had done, that they, that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him, when he had called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason the people also met him, because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, Look, see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Do you see this conflict? Conflict of philosophy. Conflict of foundation in which to build a life on. And in that day and age, if you choose poorly, it could cost you your life in a heartbeat. So people were standing back. Some people were going forward. Some people were arguing. Who is this guy named Jesus Christ? Now the people are saying, Hosanna, which literally means save us. And they are literally calling him, as we see here, the king of Israel. We see here in verse 15 that this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament that the king would come riding on a donkey. Now, put yourself in a Roman centurion's shoes. What if he was outside Jerusalem, up on his steed, and he rises this hill, and here comes his procession. People with palm branches, people throwing clothes on the ground, and here's a donkey with a man sitting on it, and they're calling him the king of Israel. Now that's almost laughable. That's laughable from a Roman perspective. Because if you understood Roman processions, if a king came into town, if a conquering general came into town, what was following him? Cages of kings that he'd conquered or generals that he'd conquered. Rows and rows of slaves that would live their life out serving Rome. You'd have wagons full of booty, gold, silver, whatever that land had to offer. You'd have a, a, a crown of laurels on their head. These, this is what happens to the defiers of Rome. That's what a real leader looks like. That's what a king looks like. And you're saying this is the king of Israel. Laughable from a Roman perspective if it wasn't so scary. The Jews are again at it. What are they doing? You know, we live in a day, as every Christian has, of a kingdom of opposites. When you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are in the kingdom of God. But we live in this physical world. But it's, a, it, it's an opposite of what the world would say. There's certain things that's asked of us that the Lord asks of us, that is just flies in the face of everything we've been taught as human beings. You know, so often we're called these little kids, and, and there's nothing wrong with a good work ethic, but, you know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You know, that's what a man does. This is what this, you know, and we have this picture of what a, a, a solid and strong human being is, and that's not exactly the way the Lord looks at things. You know, the Lord says, if you want to save your life, you have to lose it. The Lord says, if you want to be lifted up, you've got to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. If you want to be great, you need to be a servant. If you want to be first, you've got to be last. If you want to rule, you have to serve. If you want to be strong, you've got to learn how to be weak. If you want to inherit a kingdom, you have to be poor in spirit. And we're going to find, on as, find out as we read on a little here, is that if you want to live, if you want to reproduce, you have to die. The, Lord, the world looks at that and says, you're nuts. You're crazy. That's laughable. And Paul talked about how the gospel is foolishness to the Greek mind. Foolishness. Why? Because the Greeks were noted for their philosophies, for thinking. They had the guy standing and they would debate. Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, all those guys debate what life is all about. Christianity is laughable with these intelligent people. And we're finding ourselves more and more in a day and age, folks, that the ones with the credentials, I'm not saying all, of course, hear me on this, There's nothing wrong with credentials, but with the one with the credentials that have the, all the little letters that, 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 behind their name, they're the ones that the world listens to. 
And they will take a doctor, they will take someone with the right title, and they will put them on a talk show. And they've probably been married and divorced half a dozen times. They've never had kids. But because they have those letters behind their name, they're the one that's going to be interviewed on what makes a good marriage and how to raise kids. But you know that little old lady that you know lived down the street that raised a dozen, raised a dozen kids that became outstanding people in society, but she's only got a seventh grade education. Would they put her on a talk show? Not on your life. No, because she doesn't measure up in the eyes of the world. Folks, we're never going to measure up in the eyes of the world. And if we do, we're going to have to look at ourselves and say, hey, what's up? Because persecution is part and parcel of the Christian life. To be looked at as foolish is part and parcel to the Christian life. Jesus laid out the example here. Riding into town as a king on a donkey with a bunch of children running around throwing clothes and waving branches. That's the best they could do. But you know what? He's still the king of Israel. I don't care what the centurion thought. I don't care what the Pharisees thought. I don't care what the Romans thought. And I don't care how confused the people might have been. Truth was truth, whether people recognized it or not. Let me ask you something. How often do we struggle for life? How often do we fight for our rights? How often do we wrestle for greatness when we lose sight sometimes of what the Lord asks us to do? What the Lord would have us do? Now, the, I think the disciples were a little bit confused here, too, when you look at verse 16. I mean, do you remember back when Jesus fed the 5,000? They wanted to make him king. They were going to take him by force and make him king, and he got out of there. He wasn't going to let that happen. He would not receive the accolades at that time. Now, all of a sudden, when these people are cheering, he received it. Or at least he didn't rebuke them. So I think the disciples were a little confused. So let's keep reading. And I think the passage brings clarification. Verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now look, please, at what he defines glorification to be most assuredly I say to you unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies it remains alone but if it dies it produces much grain he who loves his life will lose it he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life if anyone serves me let him follow me and where I am my servant will also be if anyone serves me him, my Father, will honor. Glorification. Jesus said the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He knew just over the horizon within a few days, even though he seems to be the celebrity that day, just in a few days they're going to be yelling, crucify him. He's going to hang on that cross in shame as far as the world's concerned. And that's glorification. He literally lived out. This is an object lesson for us as to what it means to produce much fruit. Again, kingdom of opposites, you betcha. You know, if you go back to Matthew 16, again, where we were the other day, or last week, I should say, after Peter's confession of who Jesus really is, Jesus says something Really potent. Later in the passage, verse 24 of 16th chapter of Matthew. Then he said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We're going to come back to this. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit if a man, if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. For the Son of Man will come in glory and his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. If we jump back a couple chapters, then quoting Christ again in Matthew 10 38. He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy 
of me. I wonder how often we hear stuff like that preached. That, that's not a feel-good verse. He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You get the gist. I'm reading enough verses. You get the gist of what tr- the Lord is trying to get across from us. You know, Laura and I were just talking the other day. She brought up something that jumped out at her in, Matthew, in uh, Mark 10 concerning the rich young ruler. You know, and... and he, you know the story of the rich one, Euler. He asked what, what uh, needed to, he needed to do to inherit eternal life. And the Lord told him, and he couldn't do it because it involved giving away his money. He went away sorrowful. And, man, that was a big deal. Well, Peter then pipes up again. Good old Peter, you know. Pipes up again and says, well, you know, we've, we've left family. We've left this. we left this. You know, what about us? And the Lord said, you know, there is nobody that has given up lands or people or mother and father or children that will not receive a hundredfold in this world with persecution. You ever see that verse? Turn, what is it, Mark 10? I think that's where it is. I didn't plan to go there exactly, but let's look at Mark 10. How often do we kind of pull a couple words out when it's not convenient for us? Uh, Mark 10, verse 30. Well, I'll start in 29. And Jesus answered and said, Surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. With per- Sounds really good until you throw that with persecutions in there, doesn't it? You know, and... I'm, There are some preachers you will see on TV, not against TV pastors, that are going to tell you, you're a child of the king, live like one. In other words, everything's just going to be rosy. You shouldn't have any problem paying your bills. You shouldn't have a problem with prodigal children. You know, the Lord is just going to bless, 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 bless. And do I believe in the blessings of the Lord? Absolutely. But we take out the with persecutions. You know, it's not either or, it's both. And sometimes some pastors can get going and hammering so much on how hard this life's going to be, you don't even know it's worth getting up in the morning. Because they completely remove the joy that you find in the Lord by serving Him in this world. And you can go either way too far, but the fact of the matter is it's in the middle somewhere. The Blessings of the Lord and the joy of the Lord is there. It is part and parcel right now for the Christian life. How many of you guys know eternal life starts today? It doesn't start in the sweet by and by, and you just got to live through this hell on earth to maybe get there someday. That's hogwash. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you can start living for Christ and experiencing Him right now, but it will bring persecutions. It will bring problems in your life. Face it. It's reality. And you're going to have to die. Some of us may die physically, but we all have to die to ourselves. Our flesh has got to die. And too often we endorse fleshly desires and say it's God because it's God's blessing. And that may not be necessarily true. And at the same time, we might look at hardship we have in our life and say, well, God doesn't love us anymore. And that's not necessarily true either. Teaching a... a, a marriage class at Country Faith on Sunday evenings. And, you know, I, I, love, I love marriage classes because you can get a bunch of husbands and wives together and you can laugh at each other and laugh at yourself. And it's always good to know that, you know, that couple over there is struggling with the same thing as we do. We're not alone. The communication and all the different things. You know, it's amazing to me, and, I, and I've come before the Lord on this because I do a lot of marriage counseling. It's like, Lord, why would you take a man who thinks this way And take a woman who thinks this way, and you put them under one roof, and you expect them to live peaceably together. I mean, it's like, Lord, what are you thinking? Well, I'll tell you what he's thinking. He's saying both of them got to come to the middle. Both of them have to die to themselves and become more like me. And how often when marriage gets hard, we got the divorce lawyer on speed dial because that person didn't live up to my expectations. And we're out of there. 
We do that so often. I got guys coming to me and saying, oh, I'm working at this job and I'm the only Christian there and it's so rough and it's this and this and that. Well, maybe he should leave the job. I don't know. I'm not going to tell anyone what the Lord's will is for their life. But just because you're having troubles, if you are the only light in that dark place, it will not be easy. And don't go looking for another job just because it's hard. Because something being hard might be exactly what the Lord wants for you right now. Whether it's marriage, job, or anything else. But we like ease, don't we? We want to be comfortable. We don't want to be challenged. And I'm as bad as anybody, guy. I, I, I don't like persecution. I don't like the prospect of that. I like to get along with people. I want everybody to like me. I mean, guys, just like people to like you. But I don't know <laughs> if that's going to happen. As a believer, we can try. But there's going to come a point in the world's rejection of Christ, they're going to reject us. So the cross is not a fun prospect. The death on the cross that Jesus is facing here would make anybody shudder. Does it make us shudder? To take up our cross, do we really count the cost and say, Lord, I'm sold out for you. Come what may, I'm going to follow you. You know, i got a new idea for a, for a business. I think we should take like a hangman's noose, you know, and let's start making jewelry out of it, okay? So ladies can wear it around that and we can put it on rings, you know, we can make lawn ornaments, we can make bumper stickers and things like that. What do you say? You think everyone would love a hangman's noose? No. Well, let me ask you, and I'm not picking on anybody. If you want to wear a cross around your neck, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you look at that cross, what do you think of? Have we taken the awfulness, the magnitude of what the cross represents, and we've watered it down? We've made it easy for ourselves. Because the prospect of dying to self is not a fun thing. You know, crucifixion, I mean, the very word crucifixion, the word crux, the crux of a matter comes from that excruciating crucifixion. Same root meaning. And we're called to take up our cross. And you know your cross is tailor fit for you. You can't take up my cross. Because you have your issues, I have my issues, and the Lord's working on all of them. So your cross is going to do exactly for you what the Lord intends, and the same with me. But the bottom line is, we both are going to have to die to self. And it might be excruciating. And it might be painful. And there may be times when we shudder at the prospect of what we see coming down the road. You know, A.W. Tozier wrote a book called The Radical Cross. I'd recommend it to anybody. Fantastic book. Tozier was a thinker. And he writes this. I'm going to quote him a couple times this morning. He says, The cross affects its ends by destroying one established pattern, the victims, and creating another pattern, its own. Thus it always has its way. It wins by defeating its opponents and imposing its will upon him. It always dominates. It never compromises never dickers nor confers. It never surrenders a point for the sake of peace. It cares not for peace. It cares only to end its opposition as fast as possible. When the Lord says that we are to pick up our cross, it will mean the cross will end the opposition. What is the opposition that we face? The number one thing is our own flesh. Our flesh must die. You're never going to rehabilitate the flesh. You're not going to educate it. You're not going to discipline it. It must die. And that's what the Lord says. You know what? When you start preaching that, when you start preaching here, as He did in verse 24, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. The cheering stops. Where did we get the idea of triumphal entry? I'm not saying it wasn't, but I, I kind of had to ponder that a little bit. Is it really a triumphal entry? It was, but it really wasn't, was it, from a worldly standpoint? Sure, he was pronounced king, but yeah, everyone's having a good time until this passage is preached. When you look at that ride of the Lord's, you see, what did he do on the way to Jerusalem? He wept over Jerusalem. 
It wasn't a pleasant thing for him. He cursed the fig tree. There's a whole series of sermons on that parable. He cursed the fig tree. When he got into town, he cleared out the temple again. He said, you, you've, you've made my, my father's house a den of thieves. And he threw them out. And then he even went so far to tell the people to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. He told them to pay taxes. No wonder the cheering stopped. <laughs> Wasn't a popular message. All of a sudden, he's not as popular as he once was. You know, the world would say, boy, Jesus, you missed your opportunity. You had the people in the palm of your hand. You could have become the next king of Israel. You could have thrown the yoke of Rome off. You could have, could have, could have because you had the people behind you. But that wasn't what the Father had for him. What the Father had for him was the cross. And sometimes we have opportunities in our lives that aren't God's. That the world will tell us we're foolish if we don't take advantage of. But if the calling of God is something different, we better go with God's. Even if it hurts. Because that's really what true living is all about. You start experiencing the Lord in a far greater and deeper way when the flesh dies, when we don't live for ourselves. So we have to change our definition of success as believers, don't we? You have to ask yourself, what is success? When you are laying on your deathbed, what are you going to define success? And we all just have a few short years down here. What's it all about? Do we really live for the Lord or, or are we caught up in the American thing that you get your kid in a real good preschool so they can get into a good private school and so they can get into a good college so they can get a good degree so they can get a good career and a good retirement so they can retire in ease and die in a few weeks after their retirement? Is that what life is about? But that's what the American way is all too often. I'm not saying all of us. How often do we get caught up? In this, So yes, we get caught up often in praying prayers such as, Lord, help me, deliver me, uplift me, ease my pain. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Okay, The Lord wants to be there for us. We're to bring everything to Him. Nothing wrong with that. But let me ask you, to bring balance to it, do you ever pray, Lord, mold me? Use me? Mature me? Change me? Make me more like Jesus at any cost? Whoo! That's asking a lot, but you know what? That should be. That should be what we're talking about. Here's another quote from Tozier concerning the cross. The cross is a symbol of death. It stands for the abrupt, violent end of the human being. The man in Roman times who took up his cross and started down the road had already said goodbye to his friends. He was not coming back. He's not going out to have his life redirected. He was going out to have it ended. The cross made no compromise. Modified nothing, spared nothing. It slew all of the man completely and for good. It did not try to keep on good terms with its victim. It struck swift and hard, and when it had finished the work, the man was no more. The evangelism that draws friendly parallels between the ways of God and the ways of man is false to the Bible and cruel to the soul of the hearers. The faith of Christ does not parallel to the world, it intersects it. In coming to Christ, we do not bring our life up to a higher plane, we leave it at the cross. The grain of wheat must fall to the ground and die. That is the beginning of the gospel. Read the book, guys. The Radical Cross, so true. So the cheering stopped. We cheer for Jesus, the miracle worker. But do we cheer for Jesus, the crucified one? You know, Paul says in Galatians, I'll just turn there real quick. Galatians 2.20 For I have been, past tense, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. You know, in, at the end of Galatians, Paul says this, second to the last verse, 
From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Do we have the mark, folks? Now, I'm not saying we need to be able to produce scars. Paul could. But do we have the marks in our life of what the Christian life is about? Would the world look at us and say, even though they might think we're absolutely foolish, would they say, that guy carries the mark of the Christian. That gal is a Christian because, and they know the mark. Let no man trouble me, for in my body I bear the marks. What is the mark? We went to Hebrews 12 or 13. It says, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. He wasn't even good enough to be in town. Get out of town and we'll kill you there. He suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. The Greek there is the stigmata, the marks that Jesus had. Do you have a stigma in your job site, in your community, in your church for being serious about things of God, or is it just something you happen to do on Sunday mornings? We got too much of that in America, and we wonder where revival is. If people are living for God every day of the week instead of just one day, we'd have a whole different picture to look at. But does it cost something? On the humorous side, there's a guy by the name of Jack Handy who said this when he was a young kid. They had going to school, there was a bully that demanded money of him every day, usually his lunch money, and he always had to give it for fear of getting beat up. But as he got older, he decided he wanted to fight back. So he went and he started taking karate lessons. But the karate instructor wanted $5 a lesson, and it was cheaper to pay the bully, so he gave up karate. <laughs> do we do that? Let's do the easy way. We'll keep paying the enemy. And we never experience what true freedom really is. Read a story. True story. Back in the 80s. Pastor Florescu couldn't bear to watch his son being beat by communist officers. He'd already been beaten himself and he had not slept for two weeks for fear of being attacked by starving rats that the communists had forced into his prison cell. The Romanian guard wanted Florescu to give up their members of their underground church so that they too could be captured. Seeing that the beatings and the torture weren't working, the communists brought in Florescu's son, Alexander, who was only 14 years old, and began to beat the boy. While Florescu watched, they hammered his son's body unmercifully, telling the pastor that they would beat his son to death unless he told them the locations of other believers. Finally, half mad, Florescu screamed for them to stop. Alexander, I must say what they want, he called out to his son. I can't bear your beatings anymore. But the boy's body, bruised and blood running from nose and mouth, looked his father in the eye and said, Father, don't do me the injustice of having a traitor as a parent. Stand strong. If they kill me, I will die with Jesus on my lips. The boy's courage enraged the guards, and they did beat him to death as his father watched. But not only did they hold, he hold on to his faith, he helped his father do the same. We're not there yet. We have not strived to bloodshed, strive, bloodshed striving against sin yet in America. The day may be coming, folks. And until we, are we ready, I guess is the question. Are we ready for that level of persecution? It will separate the ones that are just there because Jesus is a, a circus attraction or not really sure who he is from the ones that have a bona fide walk with Jesus Christ. And let me just say this, just in passing, when those days come, folks, there's three things you're going to have to know. You're going to have to know God's love, you're going to have to know God's word, and you're going to have to know God's voice. It's kind of a three-legged stool to know how to stand in times such as that level of persecution that we can't even really comprehend anymore. If we both go back to Matthew, I said we would here. What is Jesus talking about when he's talking about dying? Taking up your cross. Matthew 
Verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me, there's three things. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now let, let me make something perfectly clear here. This is what the Lord expects us to do. Denying yourself doesn't mean you hate yourself. There's some philosophies out there that you literally whip your own body or something to bring it into submission, submission physically. No, 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 that's not what it's about. He's not talking about you hating your own body. But he's literally saying we're, we're denying or disavowing any connection to whatever the issue is. The same Greek word is used when it talks about Peter who denied Christ. Servant girl comes up and says to, well, aren't you one of them that followed Christ? He said, I don't know the man. Okay? That's how he denied. I don't know the man. Now, he knew of the man. He was safe in saying he knew of the man. Everybody knew of Jesus and had heard of him. So it isn't that he didn't know something intellectually about, but he said, I don't know the man. What about that in things of our lives? Yeah, we know the world's attractions are out there. We know that sin's out there and the pleasures of sin for a season. Yeah, they're all out. We know about those, but have we denied that? We've disavowed ourselves. We don't know that stuff. We don't live in that stuff of the world. We live for kingdom purposes. That's what he's saying here when it comes to denying yourself. We don't own ourselves. We don't have the final right, if you will, to decide what direction our life is going to go and what we're going to do. When we call the Lord Lord, we mean it. He calls the shots and not us. That's what we're literally saying when we say we deny ourselves. We're denying our self-trust, our self-sufficiency, and our self-pride. Take up your cross. We talked about that already. When the world said escape that situation, run from it, avoid it. And if you can't avoid it, strike back, get mad, get even, get offended. That's what the world would say. That's not taking up your cross and dying to self. Jesus was the example of dying to self. And follow me, which literally means to obey me. Short and sweet. Hear from God on what He'd have you do and obey. I know that sounds overly simplistic, but it is a lot simpler than we make it sometimes. The courage, the guts, the grace to do all of those things Sometimes we find lacking in our life, even though they're available. It might be just too hard and we coil away. Last week we looked at the substance is Christ. I think it wasn't Martin Luther that said, we're saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. We, our lives should show the marks. You don't do the stuff to be saved. We're saved by grace. Okay? Faith through grace. But it's the most natural thing that when we fully understand what Jesus went through on that cross and we understand what we have been saved from, it should be a natural inclination of ours to serve the one that gave so much for us. It's not out of obligation, folks. It's out of love. When we understand the love of Christ, we our spirit wants to reciprocate. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance, it says in Romans. It's the goodness of God that keeps us. It's the grace of God that empowers all of those things. It's not duty anymore. And even if it gets tough, and even if we face persecution to that level, to understand the love of God. How many of you guys have seen The Hiding Place? It's an old movie. Boy, Look it up if you haven't seen it. Corey Ten Boom. I, I, it's just an awesome, but I, I always think of the one scene. It's in the book also where they're in the camps and they're surrounded with lice and people are dying and starving to death. They're being worked to death and, and they're challenged by their fellow prisoners. What kind of God do you say you serve? Look around you. What kind of God would allow you to go through this as well as us? And they painted this horrible picture. Is he some kind of sadist? Is he like this kind of stuff? And what do you say to that? And all I remember is Betsy, all she could say was, if you only knew his love. If you only knew 
his love, you would understand all of this, or at least be able to face it. And even if you don't have the answers to those tough questions, love trumps it all. That's what it's about. So let me just have you bow your heads and close your eyes here this morning. And let me ask you, where are you at this morning? You're going through some hard times. You're wondering, Lord, how, where's the escape route here? Have you ever considered maybe there isn't one? Maybe you are a whole lot more in the center of God's will than you realize. Now, I don't know that. I'm not speaking for God in your life here, but would you consider it with Him? And say, Lord, I don't, I don't want to just get out. I don't want to take the easy way. If I need to die to myself in this situation, I'm willing. But Lord, show me how to do that. Give me another taste. Give me another shot in the arm of your love so I can face what you have for me. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the life of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that he demonstrated for us. Lord, being a man that when he stubbed his toe, it hurt too. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He understood pain. He understood loneliness. He understood betrayal. Lord, he understands everything we could possibly face in our life. And yet, he still went to the cross and died for us. Lord, what an example. And Lord, there is no possible way we can live up to that without you in our lives. So Lord, I don't know what everyone's facing in their life today, but I just pray that you would just give them a renewed vision of your love. Lord, just that deeper understanding of that infinite love that you have for your children. And Lord, also I pray that you would empower them by your Spirit to walk out what you've called them to do. Because we know Jesus did that. He was empowered. Lord, we can't improve on that system. So Lord, we just ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill each one of us as believers to walk out the life you have for us, which involves the cross. That Lord, we could bear much fruit, even with persecution. Your will be done in our lives. Show us what that means on a day-by-day -day basis. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.